Hi to everyone at New Life Church. My name is David Berham and it's a privilege to be with you via video today. I'm a member at Community Church, Chafford 100, which is in Essex, and I'm an elder as part of our eldership team. I also serve into churches on behalf of Relational Mission in the UK and in other nations. Today, we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and it was read to us from John chapter 13, and it's a great story of an example of how to be a servant. This account is only found in John's Gospel, but there are other uh, discussions that we find in the other Gospels, especially if we look at Matthew. Uh, Matthew records a discussion about who greatest, and in the answer to that question, Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And here we see Jesus not only teaching this principle, but by washing the disciples' feet, modelling it as an example to them. This is a great way of teaching others and discipling others and a good way for us as a church to live is not only do we talk about things or teach these things, but we need to model these things with our life. We need to be an example to those that we are leading and those that we're serving in our communities. There are many Christians that are not any different from anybody else and their lives don't reflect the glory of God, the love of God, or the holiness of God. Our lives should be an example. The way that we live should match up to what we believe and what we say. We should walk the walk as well as talk in the talk. And here we see Jesus being a great example to his disciples. I don't think that we fully appreciate this in our westernized culture, the lesson that Jesus was modelling to his disciples as he washed their feet. Properly understood, this foot washing maybe could be the most radical thing that Jesus ever did. Jerusalem was a filthy city full of dirt and dust and, and as you walk through the streets you would have to negotiate all of this and ashes from fires or rotten food that had been thrown out or waste from all sorts of places and as you would be walking your feet would have got absolutely filthy so foot washing would have been a simple matter of hygiene to clean again your filthy feet but also in the jewish culture if you wanted to enter the temple you would have as a minimum have to wash your feet and wash your hands so it's part of the purity legislation of the temple that if you had dirty feet or if you had been walking in that way you would be unclean you would be impure and you'd have to purify yourself by washing your feet in this culture no free man would wash the feet of another man this this role this job would be reserved for slaves and in the roman culture and Roman Empire there were many slaves in Judea there were two types of slaves there were Jewish slaves that had to be sold into slavery because of debts or something had done and there were Gentile or non-Jewish slaves and uh, they were treated differently Jewish slaves could have possessions and they were paid and like a hired worker uh, whereas the Gentile non-Jewish slaves weren't and this role of washing feet was not for the Jewish slaves because they would have made themselves impure by washing somebody else's feet whereas a Gentile, a non-Jew, was already impure and so they had this job of washing people's feet. So by offering to wash the disciples' feet, Jesus was classing himself as a Gentile slave, the lowest position in their society, the lowest rank of a human being. This is why it is so radical and this is why Peter was so against the idea. If we read from Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 it says Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, 
the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus, the preeminent one, the one who was everything and is everything, who created everything, became nothing. He put himself in the lowest position of humanity, a Gentile slave. Jesus was demonstrating the upside-down world of his kingdom to his disciples. He was showing them how things had to be. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is how you should act. Indeed, in verse 15, Jesus said that he was setting an example for them to follow. The early church got this lesson and they lived lives that were servant-hearted lives and they were known for their attitudes towards the lowest of society. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 and 28, For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. At the time this was written, it was an astonishingly radical idea, as one outside of the church would have agreed with this. The church was a radical organisation, it was a radical body of people, it was doing things differently to society. And these were the lessons that Jesus were teaching the disciples, that they went through the early church, that in order to be first, you must become a slave, and you must be willing to serve even of people. What does this mean for us today as the church today? Well, I think if we see Jesus and we see his example, the first thing it leads us to do always is to worship him. He is the one, the majestic one, king, the one who is God, who came down to be like one of us. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The ultimate humbling of Jesus as he gave himself to death, even death on a cross. As he died in our place, he took upon himself all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, so that we might be set free, we might be forgiven and reconciled to God. And the purpose of this is so that when we know Jesus, when we understand who he is, we bow the knee. We confess him as Lord. We give him the worship that's due to his holy name. If you have never worshipped Jesus, if you've never bowed the knee to Jesus as King, then you can do so today. You can come before Jesus. You can offer him your life. You can receive his forgiveness and you can be reconciled to God. As you turn to him, he will forgive you. He will restore you. And he will enable you to be in relationship with God. And you can worship Jesus. You can bow the knee to him as king. You can turn from your ways, your sinful ways, and start to follow Jesus and his ways and receive his life, his abundant life, his eternal life. Turn to Jesus now. Be forgiven. Be set free. And know that you can worship him. And that is our response as we see what Jesus has done for us, how he become nothing so that we can know him and know God. We worship him, we honour him, we glorify him. That is the overflow of our heart today. So we worship Jesus who gave up everything for us. So secondly, we must follow his example. We must humble ourselves before God and we must be willing to serve one another. Church today for some has become 
quite consumeristic. The consumer culture in which we live has seeped into the church and we gather at church and we measure the success of our meeting dependent on what we get out of it. You might hear comments like, I didn't get much from the sermon today or the worship didn't do much for me today. Wouldn't it be much better if we took the attitude of Christ, that we followed his example and we gathered together saying, what can I give today? How can I serve others today? How can I be a blessing to my brothers and sisters? We need to follow his example, not only as we gather together as church, but in every aspect of our life. We need to know that Jesus became nothing so that he can be a blessing to others. And as we give ourselves to God, we humble ourselves so that God can use us to be a blessing to others. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth and the life. We love his truth. We love the promises of Jesus. We love his life, his abundant life, his eternal life. But sometimes we're reluctant to follow his way. But he is the way. He is our example. And we must follow his example. So we worship him. We follow his example. And then thirdly, we must demonstrate to the world what it means to live like Jesus. The church is a glorious church, a radiant church, full of the love of Jesus. And we are Jesus to the world. We are the light of the world. He has filled us with his presence so that we can be a blessing to others. How we live together, how we serve one another, how we love one another is a great example to the world around us. We demonstrate unity, we demonstrate equality, we demonstrate love, we demonstrate peace. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them equally, equal in worth, equal in responsibility. In Galatians 3 that I read earlier, Paul said, there's no male and female, there's no slave nor free, we're all one in Christ Jesus. This unity is born out of a servant-hearted love. We must love one another. We must serve one another. And we will demonstrate this to the world around us. The church has a special role to play in demonstrating to the world, especially today, that unity, love, peace can only be found in Jesus Christ. And it flows from a servant-hearted love for one another. We accept everyone because Jesus accepts everyone. He loves everyone. We must love everyone. No matter of their class, their gender, their race, their education, God's love is for them. So our love must be for them. This doesn't mean to say that we're all the same because unity doesn't equal uniformity. We have roles to play, differing gifts to use, different places where God has placed us but we are one one new man in Christ we are the body of Christ we are united in Christ we are brothers and sisters in Christ and as we see the example of Jesus to serve one another we must do the same I've been a leader at community church since we planted the church 25 years ago and in that time I've been called all sorts of Pastor David, uh, Elder David, even Bishop David or Reverend David. And uh, I always come back and say, no, my name is David. I'm an elder and that is the role and the function that I perform in the church. But I'm David. I'm a fellow follower of Jesus. I'm a friend, I'm a brother. Let's all just be one. There's no hierarchy in the church. There's no special names for anybody. We are one, one in Christ Jesus. When we were in Nigeria and I was doing some preaching for about 10 days over there in Lagos, on the Saturday we went to a, a conference that had been put on and uh, we didn't know these people very well. They, they knew me, but we didn't know them very well. And uh, when we arrived, we were a bit late because of the traffic and we were ushered to the front. They were already worshipping and, and the leader came over and said, David, uh, we've prepared the platform for you. Uh, we've anointed it, we've anointed the lectern and you can preach from up there. When I looked, it was 10 foot above everybody else uh, and there was nothing else on the stage, on this big stage, other than this lectern uh, waiting for me. 
And so I said, no, that's not for me. Please, can you bring the lectern down to this level so that I can be amongst everybody else and preach and teach from there? And reluctantly they did, uh, and they brought it down. Actually, I preached twice uh, in that service, and at the end we gave an altar call, and the whole of the auditorium stood up and came forward. It was just amazing. But I, I, I didn't want to be above everyone else. I didn't want to be separate from everyone else. We are one. We are the body of Christ. We are together in all that God has called us to do. And this servant-hearted attitude, this love, should be a demonstration to the world. There is no hierarchy. There is no corporate ladder to climb in the church. We are all humble servants of the living God. Paul, in Romans 1, when he introduces himself, he says, Paul, servant of Christ Jesus. And the word servant there in Greek is doulos, which means slave. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. He had learned uh, from the disciples and from Jesus this teaching that you have to become nothing. You have to humble yourself to be a servant of Jesus and a servant of each other. The world wants to see something that is different. The unity of the church can demonstrate Jesus in this way. Especially, I think, in these times, we've got racial division uh, happening across the world. Uh, the church has got something to say and something to model in this area. We've got over 35 nations worshipping with us every Sunday and it's a beautiful thing to see people coming together in harmony, united in the love of Jesus. Only Jesus can do this, only the gospel can do this, only the church can demonstrate this to the world in which we live. So we worship Jesus because of who he is and what he's done. We follow his example and we demonstrate to the world this humble servant-hearted unity through Jesus Christ. And then finally, I want to say that alongside this demonstration, there must be proclamation. We must declare Jesus. Every opportunity that we see in the early church, they preached the gospel, they shared good news with people. If we follow the example of Jesus and the servant-hearted love flows through the church, people will ask why we are different. And as people ask and inquire why we live this way, we must be ready to talk to them and tell them about Jesus. Jesus who humbled himself by dying on a cross, dying in our place, taking our sin and shame upon himself. The one who has set us free, the one who has forgiven us, our saviour. We need to tell them about Jesus so that they too will know his love. Will you follow his ways? Will you follow his example? Will you demonstrate to the world the love of Jesus Christ and be ready to share the good news with them this week and in the weeks ahead? I pray that you will. May God bless you all.